Hello, everybody. Before we continue diving deeper into an exploration of the diversity of animals, what we need to know is exactly what are the principles that are used for exploring, for studying animal diversity. And so here we're going to see some general characteristics of what makes an animal an animal. Another uh, important concept to explore is uh, what are the main types of uh, body plants you can find uh, among the members of the various animal phyla. Also, what developmental, developmental trends uh, we can identify uh, because all of these characteristics, body plans, embryonic development, uh, just the arrangement of tissues and levels of complexity of the animal are precisely what zoologists use for placing animals into one phylum uh, or another phylum within the animal kingdom. So let's take a look at some of the general characteristics of what makes animals precisely animals. And so one of those is going to be that all animals uh, are in need of acquiring energy through the consumption of food. There is no animal capable of doing what plants do, which is using an external source of energy like light and converting that light into the chemical energy in uh, glucose or fats or proteins that animals will have to depend on. And so because animals cannot process their own energy and they have to eat something else, we can use that strategy for capturing food as a ways of classifying animals. And so here you will see names that perhaps you're familiar with. For example, a herbivore is going to be an animal that feeds on plant material, uh, which is going to be a producer. Plants make their own food. So a herbivore is an animal that feeds on a producer like a plant. Then you will see another term here, like a carnivore, another term we're familiar with. Carnivores are those who eat meat. But technically, a carnivore is going to be an animal that is feeding on a consumer of plants. And so carnivores sometimes are going to be consuming those that are consuming other animals as well. But this is a consumer feeding on a consumer that is going to be a carnivore. Uh, and... Uh, the next term we see here is going to be decomposers. Some animals have strategies uh, in the body and also internally for, you know, in terms of their digestive abilities for eating the wastes of other organisms or the waste produced, excreted by other organisms. And so that's what decomposers do. It is not a glamorous lifestyle, but it is going to be one that often provides an animal like a decomposer, exactly what it needs in terms of energy. Uh, parasites are going to be different from carnivores in that a parasite doesn't kill immediately the host on which it's feeding. So when you think about parasites, think about external parasites such as ticks, mites, fleas. Uh, there are sometimes uh, external parasites that are going to be like sucking the life out of another one, like, like fish. Uh, that are sucking the blood of, of another fish. Uh, and so they can come in many different forms. Parasites can also be internal. And here we can think about worms, intestinal worms. Worms that also live in the cardiovascular system uh, in the blood. And so depending on what uh, strategy an animal is using, uh, that can be used as a way of classifying uh, animals as well. Uh, in terms of tissues, animals are going to be organisms that have cells organized into a diverse number of tissues. Previously in class, I mentioned that there are two kinds of tissues that are unique to animals, meaning only animals will have them. And that is going to be muscular tissue and nervous tissue. Uh, animals can also have connective tissue. Those are going to be used for attaching one layer of cells to another one or one organ to another. Uh, connective tissues also serve providing structural support and protection. Bone, for example, is a type of connective tissue. Cartilage is a type of connective tissue. And the other type of tissue we can find in animals is going to be epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues are going to be those that are used for lining, covering, the outside of the animal 
but on the inside, animals often have cavities, spaces, and those also need to be lined. When you think, for example, about an internal cavity such as a stomach, there's going to be epithelial cells that are going to be there covering uh, the stomach and separating other cells from the potentially harmful digestive juices that are contained within the stomach. One of the details we can mention also about animal tissues is that uh, the, and cells is that the cells do not have cell walls. So tissues will have to be protected by other tissues, but not cell walls. And, and this is not a, a sad misfortune because not having cell walls means that the body of the animal can be flexible for the many different types of locomotion an animal can exhibit. Uh, and um, it's just a, an interesting detail that you should be able to remember. Support for animal cells and tissues will come from specialized forms of tissues like I mentioned bone, cartilage, and even certain tough forms of skin. Another uh, detail about animals is that all animals are going to uh, depend on reproductive strategies, whether it's asexual, meaning that just uh, the animal would be growing another copy of itself, like in the case of the budding of cnidarians. Uh, asexual reproduction can also be in the form of fragmentation. When you take the body of a sponge and you break it, the sponge doesn't necessarily uh, have to die, but the broken fragments will go on to heal and make the cells that are missing and produce completely uh, perfect adult individuals from the broken pieces. Cnidarians can also do that. Uh, but also animals are going to engage in sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is going to be when sex cells are needed. And uh, one of the details you will remember is that when a sperm joins an egg, the end result is going to be a fertilized egg, also known in biology as a zygote. What happens to the zygote after it forms? Usually in a matter of seconds, this zygote would experience the first round of division, breaking the zygote into two cells. Each of the two cells will then divide and make four cells. The four cells will divide and make eight cells, and that is exactly what you see in this illustration. The divisions will continue. Notice, however, that early in this development, there's going to be mostly reduction of the cells in half. Every time they divide, they're not growing, they're not going through an interface, that, that is long for sure. They're simply going to be dividing, dividing, dividing. Uh, mostly what they are dividing is the genetic material. They duplicate it in the S uh, stage of interface. Once the chromosomes are duplicated, the cell then divides, but it doesn't really grow. And so this illustration of a blastula over here in comparison to the eight cell stage, uh, it's not much larger than this one here. Notice that the cells are simply getting smaller as divisions progress. And so this is the beginning of embryonic development. When the zygote divides for the first time and eventually produces a sphere type of a structure. Notice that this sphere known as the blastula is hollow. There is space inside which is filled by a fluid. This is not air. This is not empty. This is filled with a fluid. So this blastula is going to be one of the earlier stages in embryonic development for most animals. What some animals will experience is that once this blastula is formed, there's going to be a migration inwards of some of the cells that used to be on the outside but now they are migrating and growing inwardly into this space known as the blastocele. When they do that, they begin the formation of a second layer. Notice now that there is a layer on the outside, we can now call the ectoderm, and the layer that is growing inside, forming an internal layer, is going to be known as the endoderm. On the outside, ecto, as you know, means outside. In the inside, endo means internal, inside. And so for many animals, the first two layers of embryonic development is going to be the ectoderm and the endoderm. 
development may continue from here into an embryo that has three layers of development. And uh, these stages of development, having a gastrolite with two layers or a gastrolite with three layers, are going to be criteria that are used in the classification of animals. And we will see in lab exactly how that classification and the levels of development of the embryos can uh, go, work hand in hand. Uh, and I think that that's going to be the, the last concept that I'm going to introduce in this uh, short video. In review, animals are going to reproduce either by asexual means, like budding or fragmentation, or sexually, that takes the body of the animal through various stages of embryonic development, like the ones I have introduced in this presentation. Remember also the animals have sophisticated tissues, tissues with specific functions that can eventually form organs. There are no cell walls surrounding the cells of animals, but support can come from specialized tissues. And also remember that all animals are going to be heterotrophs, meaning that they have to eat something else. They have to eat other things in order to obtain the energy necessary to power their daily activities. I will continue exploring more of the general concepts about animal uh, body and classification on another video. That's all for right now.